Yeah, thanks for inviting me here. Well, you probably saying, I apologise, I'm standing for David Ball, and unfortunately had to go to Canada at very short notice, so to bear with me through the presentation, so I've sort of had to pick it up on a very short notice. A um, bit about my background, um, I joined Neemly four years ago, almost to the day, as almost David started the journey with the business at Neemly. My background has always been in ornamental horticulture, in bedding and pot plants, in research and more in the technical aspects. And I joined very much as David started to grow the business to look at the planning, scheduling, quality of the ornamental plant production. More recently, my role has changed with more into technical product development and very much focusing on the new site and the automation or the resources that we're putting into that field. Sorry, just move on this one. So what I aim to try and do, um, say about who we are, give us some of the history behind where we've gone as a small nursery to where we are and where we're planning to go to how that automation and strategy is fitting into our model. Maybe not to the degree as we're talking about this morning, but even I'm getting to the point where there's so much information out there and it's moving so quick. You know, from one month to the other, we think, are we making the right choices? But we have to make a choice. And the future technologies. It's not just having the facilities available to us, it's how we use those facilities is probably more of a challenge technically for us that we're trying to adapt to. For those who don't know where we are, you know, as we're all down the south coast here in this sunny part of the world, we're in the lovely flat area spalling up in Lincolnshire, so a little bit away from here, but that's where we're based. Just to go through a little bit more explanation about our business, it goes back to uh, David's mum and dad, Tony and Jane, there on the left hands of the business, who started Bridge Farm Nurseries back in the late 1980s, growing pot plants, foliage plants, uh, flowering house plants, ironically almost coming back in full circle. They started on a small, um, small plot, developed that and grew the business through to about the early 2000s, and then that became more of a challenge to them. Com competition from Europe meant they couldn't compete price-wise. They sat down, reviewed the business, and moved in edible herbs, and set up a joint venture growing potted herbs to the supermarket, supplying Aldi. Good time, right place, Aldi has grown, that business grew very successfully. In 2010, the opportunity arose where there was a nursery for sale, namely Nursery in Gosberton, where hence we get the name. That was purchased in the business. Um, and you've got David in the middle there. He's sitting in a crop of um, flowering pansies. In 2014, we started into our investment program. That was with Tony and David's and bank money to build Horseshoe Nursery, pitched in the middle, um, which is now where we're at now, our part of our journey. Uh, Zion has been mentioned as purchased in 2016. That's Zion UK. We're at a controlling interest in the bigger Dutch group, which served to different retail customers. So we wanted that direct link to the retailers. So that opened up doorways for us to access that market. David has a family. I'm not sure how often he sees the family when he travels. Uh, his young son, Finney's on the right-hand side. He's uh, probably training our staff, then start weighing out a cup herd facility in Basel. Uh, looks like he's slightly overdone it on the mountain he's put on the scales there. Just the pictures which go back to say where we all started for us as on our businesses. So 86, that's where they started. Tony and Jane brought that nursery. 88, built the glass. 2004, struggled change the herbs. 2015, that's the herb facility, which now is the point of moving to the new site that we're building. So it's this growth, but interesting, that growth has happened over the period of time. What we see now is a business, we've grown rapidly in the last five or six years. Um, the difference in the color of the two, uh, two green is really the Neemly inertia and the Zion acquisition to see that growth. For me, for my lifetime in a business, I've never been in a business that's grown so quick. Uh, we never seem to stand still. It's always something that we have to do and develop. Um, but he's taken the business from loss-making, in effect, when, he, when David joined the business, um, through to, yeah, just under £30 million. Just to point out, we're through this journey. Um, the business and, and David himself won many accolades with the Grow of the Year in 2007. David himself was Entrepreneur of the Year. And that puts him in front of um, uh, different people, different businesses, where he started to bring some of those mentalities in, into the business as it stood. As I said, the business was sold last year, or was a management buyout with a private investment, valued it at £30 million, and they're invested now in the new facilities that we're building at Clay Lake. In terms of employment, we're now a big employer in the area, growing from six up to 250, and then at peak, we're nearly to 1,000 when we have to deal with Mother's Day packing and other events at the time of the year. David joined the business back in that 2010. He did an economics degree, not in horticulture at all, didn't even plan to come back into the business at that point in time. But I think his mum and dad said, come back and have a look. With the purchase of Neemley in 2012, Dave was almost given the job, go and run that business. 
Straight away, he said, this is unsustainable. The nursery is very traditional. A couple of pictures here. Small houses, small blocks of glass, low eaves, generally grown on the floor, a lot of manual input, a lot of labour cost in there. And labour was actually about 30% of the total cost of production. And straight away, he said, unsustainable. Couple that with what we've seen in a national living wage, we're never going to compete. Yeah, we can put our prices up, try and get more money for a product that we were trying to sell. We're never going to happen. We could just not do that. It was just, it was just a, a dream if we could have charged that. Um, coupled with that, we, we then had to see how else can we change the business. Dave, from his background, has his models, has his viewpoints, and he wanted a strategy for the business. And this is something from uh, Michael Porter, very old, I think, on analysis, and looked at where does our business sit. So we have either the differentiated offering, where a business tries to drive up the prices, increase its profitability. To do that, it's got to have a distinctive value to its customers. We do a little bit of that, but primarily, David, is we want to be the lowest cost of production. We have to balance price with an acceptable quality. And in terms of the EVLE, we are then driving the cost down of our production and be sustainable in that. We could not do that in that previous facility. We had to then go and invest, which is not sustainable. It's also a balance for us in the customers. We are taking an enormous step and a commitment by putting that money in, and we have to have customers that come with us for that journey. It's very hard to get contracts for the next year or two years, or they might verbally say it, but very often it doesn't always stand up. But that's part of their becoming to realise that as an industry, they've got to work with businesses, certainly in ornamentals, that are investing um, for the future. The investment I've got pictured here is, is our horseshoe facility. So this is what we've built or started to build in 2014 or 15. And that was the first phase was just to consolidate all our production. We're typical, all these little nurseries or five or six nurseries growing different plants. And it was just uncoordinated, very high cost. So bring them all into one distribution point. We could pack it, control our processes. And at this point, we've moved from a wholesale um, to direct to the retail customers. And then on the back of that, we built 10 acres of production. And this was geared around benches. We have two real options or two rows to go down. Do we grow on the floor and use automation along those lines, handling systems, or we go benches? Very much we're a bench business in that sense to move <coughs> the product around as a handling point of view. Uh, is there a flood? We water from below, better for plant growth, don't have to water above, et cetera, et cetera. Is biomass heating, computer controlled on screens, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that unit means then... We, uh, we have a capability to take labour out, very much take labour out of our handling than we saw earlier in the pictures. And we have potting machines and transplanters. I'm hoping there's a little video now that might work. Just to give you a flavour, it's a home video, nothing like the smart things you've seen earlier on this morning. This is the sort of thing that's, that, that, that we do. This is not new technology. Um, don't, don't, I'm not standing out and saying, oh, this is new, we're using it. But we have, you know, it's out there in Holland and we just have to put it into our system. And it takes money, it takes investment to do that. So we have potting machines that lay all the product down onto the bench without any manual input. You've got one person now just controlling the machine as the, obviously the fingers are picking up the pots, takes them for spacing. It works. As some of the points down below, it's consistent. One of the great things is it just allows consistency to our production. We don't have people out there with sticks trying to get them spaced at the right density. We can set the machine up and it will do exactly what we wanted it to do and we can take off the bars and very quickly to change it to other pot dimensions. So it's a quite a flexible machine at the same point. Um, you see in a minute it's just going to start scanning around, so it's quite a centralised production unit. So we don't have people willy nearly all out in the glass house, it's a nightmare to control what they're doing. We have in one area, less of them, we can control them. Uh, the benches after each use go back, get washed, come into a stacking unit and obviously fed to the line. So we've taken away so much uh, manual and repetitive labour, but just make it more reliable, more consistent, and easy, easier for the staff. We have heard this morning, th the challenge is this, we've got to reduce labour. Yes, that's all we need to get to reduce that cost of production. But we do need that more technically able people. And that is the, the, to handle the machines, to know how they work, how they operate, how to maintain them. That person there has really got to, to love and crest that machine to keep it running for those 24 hours of the day. And we don't really have this at the moment. We also make mistakes, is we put in a lot of money in and we don't always get it right. So we've got a lovely machine there putting the packs down on the bench, great. It works for that pack when we had to change the pack to a different customer. Uh, we had to, the transplanted, we just, we couldn't cope with the transplanter speed. So simply because we had the little 90 degree twist on the pack. 
So yeah, we practiced that, just did a, a single line conveyor so it went down quicker. Um, and that's all about planning, looking ahead, that's what we're doing at the moment for the new site, to make sure there's no bottlenecks in what we're trying to achieve. Um, yeah, I'll we'll move on. Hopefully that one might stop in a minute. <laughs> it's running in the background. So as well as my challenge starting off doing the ornamentals as a business and the re on the retail or the market side is we've got a herb business, potted and cut. We have the bedding and ornamentals which the business is sort of based around and then three years ago we went into the cut flowers. So we're aiming then for the retail, the customer to offer them all avenues, if you, you could argue, with the different crop types that they can uh, sell, which are a little bit unique. Um, I've got another video now, so I'm maybe a bit boring, but it's good just to look at stuff rather than me just talking, to keep, uh, talking away. But tulips, we went into cut flowers um, three years ago, as I said. We do tulips, we do flowering stocks, and this year we started to do lilies. Um, tulips, we started just under half a million. We're now doing 12 million, and our capacity is 60 million. And that's where one of the horseshoe sites is now going to switch to cut flower production as we build the new facility. Um, but that growth, that speed of growth, brought its own challenges. Um, and we had to invest in machinery, automation, robotics to achieve that. Are we all right, time? Okay. Uh, process here. The tulips only take three weeks really in the glass house to force. So it's a very quick uh, turnaround. Now, we used to have probably eight to 12 people trying to crop these things and grade them. And oh, it was just, it was a nightmare. Very, very difficult. So four people crop onto the belt. Uh, simply they're still doing a process, they're still looking at the crop, making the decision what they want to take off that bench at the right stage, within reason. Goes through the machine, one person just quickly tweaks them out so it can feed the machine effectively, doesn't block it up, chops the bulb off the bottom, go through the, um, presents the, the flower stem now so the camera and x-ray machine can to work its magic, tell us what the length is, the colour grading, etc, etc. And we have four bunching stations then that basically group it together. And we can set the different grades. you see in a minute, it will put it on the belt. You won't see it, there's a color bar there that tells the operator, you know, red is that grade, uh, grade, green is that one, blue is that, etc. And then they bunch them up ready to go to the packing line or we sell on the product as a raw, in a raw material. Um, I mean, it saved us 80%. It, it took out a huge amount of labor. We could not basically grow tulips without putting that investment in, which is you know, half a million euros for the bit of machinery itself. But it's the product quality and consistency it gave us from that manual putting the bunches together with uneven heads. This just eliminated it all. So we've got a much better quality product at the end of it and consistent. Though he's put a comment in about HR manager toilets and pay rises, I, I didn't get around to asking what he meant entirely by that, other than we don't have an HR manager because we try not to add overheads to the business. We have we have a, a scanning system for labour, so we're checking them in and out, and we control the toilet breaks. Because on the scale of the business, when it's you know, 75 acres, walking from A to B, uh, we just got to make sure they're not taking too much time. And pay rises, we touched on that. That pay inflation is huge for us as business. The national minimum, minimum wage, yes, but we have to keep the balance through the rest of the structures of the business, team leaders, supervisors. So the whole lot lifts every time. But we want to do that, because we want to get better paid staff to come into the business that can run the machinery. And that is one of our biggest challenges at the moment. Um, investment is fundamental to us. Um, you hope you've seen that with some of the, the, the videos I've just shown. We've used in a container system. The variable cropping that we do, we're a little bit unlike maybe at tomatoes or strawberries. We're doing a wide range of ornamental products in that glass house. And that is our biggest challenge, how to handle that. The input part is fairly straightforward, potting machines that you saw. The marketing still remains a challenge to us, how we can con consolidate eight or 10 different products onto a Danish trolley and ship that out to a Tesco or an Asda is still the part that we're working on. And that's really what we're focusing on the new site to put that, that, that uh, structure in place. Um, product quality is a given uh, for our customers, it is for all of us, but we're aiming with that facility to improve the quality, uh, to be more consistent, get a moment of robustness into our products, which better shelf life, less waste is in store, less shrinkage, and hopefully great garden performance at the end of it. And it's not a one-off. I mean, as you said, we are building a new site as it stands. Week five, we start going in, uh, and that's, that becomes the next, next phase of, of a three-phase project. We touched on it before. David's thoughts that Brexit is, is an opportunity. 
clearly for us because our customers are asking, certainly on our side, they are concerned about what happens to the supply chain, so they're asking us to do more. That's great. Labour, I agree with some other comments earlier, it happened before Brexit. We were losing the staff. The good quality staff were earning more money back in Germany and Poland. It, it's sort of a, a smoke, it's not a smoke screen, but it was happening before, um, and it's all down to money. Yeah, if they earn more money elsewhere, they're not going to come to us for those manual jobs. Hence, we've got to automate or put robots in. Online, totally agree. That's a big factor we're looking at closely and how we can grow and manage that supply chain. Um, mergers, consolidation in the market will continue. We talked already earlier this morning about as the Sainsbury's. That will happen. It will affect us at some point. We don't know how, but it will. Yeah, in, in just a reduced ret retail base. And though we don't grow food other than the herbs, yeah, the population is growing. That resource we hear in, in, in the press. How are we going to feed all those people? Touched on that. I should have spent more time. Technology. We've got fantastic facilities. That sense of technology we're looking at more now. How to look at plants, control the growth. This example is just water deficit, controlling plant growth by withholding water to control height. We've got a fantastic facility, but we need a mechanism. We haven't got growers to keep going around all those, um, looking at every plant and weighing them, etc. So that technology allows us to then control the irrigation system to then reduce the height of the plants, etc. And that's a big part now we're looking at for the new site, is, is the eyes and ears of the nursery. Technologies, uh, drones, I think we touched on. I know some growers are using it. So you go out in a glass house and it just pinpoint things. So you can look at a bigger area very quickly and sense dry areas, wet areas, pest, disease, etc. and precision basis. Danish trolleys, we know there's the robots out, as we see in Amazon warehouses, and go in, pick a trolley up, move it the way you want it on GPS. We're not doing it. We don't think the technology is right for us yet, and it's blinking expensive, but it will come. A robotics on sticking cuttings is something that has been around now for a number of years, but 10 years ago, you would have thought it was impossible. But as you say, everything is changing very, very quickly. Though his last comment he put up is, and it's quite relevant in a sense, it's, it's maybe not the strongest of the species that survives, nor maybe intelligent, but it is the one that's most responsive to the change. And that probably echoes out what we've been hearing this morning. So thank you very much.